This is sort of a sequel to my video, The Terror and the Basics of the Franklin Expedition. It's extra info that I didn't put in because I was trying to keep it as basic as possible. My main aim with that video was getting you interested in seeing the terror. Even though that was my main aim, I'm really more interested in the real history. The way I'm looking forward to seeing the show. So, if like me you're interested in real history, here's another video about the Franklin Expedition. This video will give you some more information about the march itself, but mainly concentrate on the three big figures in the crew. Franklin himself, Captain Crozier, and Commander Fitzjames. To remind you about the Franklin Expedition, HMS Erebus and Terror vanished in 1845 seeking the Northwest Passage. The ships were frozen in the Arctic for years, and almost 130 men died from starvation, botulism, the cold, scurvy, and far more things. The majority died in a death march south to civilization. The loss of the Franklin Expedition really can't be understated when it comes to the sheer amount of attention it got. The greatest power in the world had lost its most advanced and most expensive expedition. It's like the moon landing crossed with a lost Malaysian jet. Imagine if Apollo 11 had flown to the other side of the moon and just vanished. For years afterwards, the Franklin Expedition and those searching for it were massive news. Franklin, the captain of the Erebus and leader of the expedition, was a pacifist. An unusual thing to be when both a rear admiral and the governor of a brutal penal colony. He didn't set Tasmania up as a penal colony, though. He arrived and made things somewhat less brutal. He became a pacifist during the Battle of Trafalgar. Seeing so much death up close changed him. And somehow he managed to work his way up the naval ranks while being opposed to violence. It's like a comedy sketch. It's probably lucky that he was active in one of the most peaceful periods of the 19th century. For the British, anyway. You see, the Royal Navy was huge, but between the Napoleonic and Crimean Wars, they didn't do that much warring. So, they got heavily involved in exploration, and that's why many of the exploration ships were former warships. For sailors, this was a great deal, as a Navy man who doesn't have an assignment would receive half his usual wages. But exploration counted as an assignment, with the potential for extra money and possible fame. You see, men weren't assigned to ships until reassigned. They were left on land at half pay or assigned to a ship for the duration of a particular mission, whether that be war, exploration, or whatever. Franklin undertook three sort of successful polar explorations before the one that bore his name. They were all over land, and in the first, he was reduced to eating his own shoes to survive. He lost 11 of his 20-man party, there was murder and cannibalism. Seriously, it's like the famous expedition that was named after him was a big-budget reboot of his first. Franklin was also a devout Christian who, though he banned drinking and gambling, held a very light leash on the men under his command. Franklin's second in the expedition, Crozier couldn't be any different. Thanks to his many experiences with polar conditions, he was far less lenient. Franklin's attitude was to try and be his men's friend, or a father figure. Crozier was a far more experienced and successful explorer than Franklin, he was only interested in keeping his men alive, and it didn't matter if they liked him afterwards. Crozier of the HMS Terror probably should have been in command. He had more than enough experience, but internal politics of the British Navy were against him. He wasn't nobility, he was Irish and the wrong kind of Christian. But apart from that, he never really sought the position of leader. He was a melancholic who underestimated his own abilities, even though he was possibly the most experienced active polar explorer in the world. On top of all that, Crozier had many of his positions as second-in-command handed over to Commander Fitzjames of the Erebus. The second-in-command was traditionally in charge of choosing a crew from those who were currently unassigned. Anyway, Fitzjames, who had no polar experience, got the job of choosing the men. And he chose a lot of his old military buddies who also had no polar experience. Fitzjames was also handed responsibility for the scientific work the expedition was supposed to do during the voyage, mainly magnetic stuff. Now again, the second-in-command is usually in charge of the science, and Crozier was a member of the Royal Society, the most prestigious scientific organization of its day due to his work with polar magnetism. So why was Fitzjames given it? This is going to sound much more harsh than I actually mean it. Fitzjames was, by all accounts, highly competent, brave, kind, funny, and one of the golden boys of the British Navy. But he wanted fame. His plan was to sail the Northwest Passage, do groundbreaking science in the way, and get left off in Russia, where he'd travel overland back to Britain, become famous, write a book, and be able to retire. He was a bastard from a noble family, so he wanted to make a name for himself. Fitzjames was also briefly in the running to command the whole expedition. Yes, the guy with no polar experience. Why did he get all this special treatment? Believe it or not, it wasn't family connections. One of the reasons he was so driven was that his family didn't open doors for him. He even had to use, and I quote, highly irregular means to become a midshipman. Instead, he fell in with Sir John Barrow, the father of British polar exploration. Sir John's son George was caught up in something highly scandalous, we don't know what, and Fitzjames paid someone off to protect him and his family's reputation. And from then on, Fitzjames was Sir John Barrow's favourite. Anyway, back to Crozier, why would he even go? He'd done a huge amount of polar voyages, been as close to both poles as was feasible at the time, discovered much of the coast of Antarctica, and not even won a knighthood. 
He'd written no books and achieved no fame. Even today, he's a fairly unsung figure in polar exploration. So why go? Because, believe it or not, being a captain wasn't a massively well-paying job. He was middle-aged, had no wife and few savings, and if he didn't go, then who knows when we would offer another command. He also recently just heartbroken, ironically, by Franklin's niece. When voyaging with Ross, the greatest polar explorer in the early Victorian era, they stopped off in Tasmania and were entertained by Governor Franklin and his family. Crozier fell in love with his niece Sophia, and she didn't return the affection. According to Lady Franklin, years later, she liked Crozier very much, but she'd seen the hurt that having a sailor for a husband caused a wife, and so she never agreed to courtship. So with Franklin assigned to command the expedition, it's possible that he wanted to impress her. To make this even sadder, Sophia sent letters to Crozier aboard the rescue ship so went to try and save him. She never married, so maybe she regretted what happened between them. If you're creating a fictional narrative out of the Franklin expedition, Crozier is the natural hero. He was a captain, but he wasn't nobility. He fought his way up the ranks through unshowy hard work. He was a lovelorn brooding figure who wrote on a superior and always did his duty. He took command when Franklin died, and even though it was probably impossible, he did his duty and tried to get his men home through a thousand miles of tundra. Plus, there's the fact that even in the years after the events, it was common belief that he was one of the last men to die if not the last. Hell, even his biography is called Last Man Standing. So why do people think this 50-year-old guy lasted so long, when men far younger and stronger didn't? Simply put, the Inuit said the leader of the last men marching south was called Aglica, which was Crozier's Inuit nickname. You see, when he was on one of his first polar voyages, he helped a local Inuit tribe with medical stuff, and he became such good friends with one of the members that he taught Crozier some of his language. Yes, Crozier was also the officer who could speak Inuit. Naturally, Admiral, it makes sense to make him second in command to a man who wants ate his shoes to survive a journey, and treat him like he's subordinate to a fame-seeking commander that he outranked. Anyway, Crozier's friend was called Aglica, and they took each other's name as a nickname when dealing with the other's people. To the Inuit, Crozier was called Aglica, and to the British, Aglica was called Crozier. Crozier even promised that he'd return to the area's captain of his own ship, which he did. Anyway, they all said that Aglica was in command of the desperate survivors heading south, but Aglica meant Long Strider, and was a nickname given to various important white men both before and after the Franklin Expedition by several different bands of Inuit. So, we don't know who they were referring to when they talked about Aglica. Searcher Charles Francis Hall believed Aglica was Crozier, but we don't know, and never will. The March South was a never-ending series of tragedies that we only have a shattered picture of. There was the Pegler Papers, a steward skeleton was found face down in the snow by Searcher Francis McClintock. He died where he fell. We don't know the identity of the skeleton, but one of the papers he carried was from Harry Pegler, a superior officer. Many of the papers can't be read any longer, and those which can seem to be diaries, newspaper clippings, addresses, and a parody of a poem that was popular at the time, which means that someone took time out of dying in the Arctic to write a weird owl about it. It's possible that he was also carrying last letters from his fellows, too. The thing that takes this from sad to sad and weird is that some of the papers were written in reverse, not mirrored in reverse. When they were first found, they were thought to be in German. It's thought that the reverse writing was an attempt to maintain the direst privacy from his shipmates. There were two whole skeletons found in King William Island in return to the UK, both in the decades after the expedition when identification was somewhat primitive. One of them was identified as Lieutenant Lavasconti on account of his gold tooth and buried under the monument to the Franklin expedition at the old Royal Naval College Chapel in Greenwich. The other was identified as Lieutenant Irving and returned to his family in Scotland. Both of these are almost definitely not the right people. Now, we know that it's not Lieutenant Levisconti in Greenwich. In 2009, during renovation, some tests were done on the bones, and they found out that whoever he was, he was raised in Scotland. Levisconti was from the south of England. The prevailing theory is that it's assistant surgeon Harry Goodsir of the Erebus. The Irving grave is a far harder question, because he was found in a stone tomb that had probably been opened by the Inuit. What identified him as Irving was a small medal for achievement in mass that was lying nearby. We don't know if Irving's medal was placed in the tomb with them, or if Irving placed it there as a mark of respect for a fallen friend. For various reasons, Franklin, Crozier, Commander Gore of the Erebus, and more have been suggested as the possible identity of the poor man. The body in the grave in Scotland has never been DNA tested, so we can only speculate. It's thought that the man in the tomb was likely of some importance, because they went to the effort of creating a tomb for him. But it was likely very early in the death march, so it's possible that he was simply the first to die. Commander Gore is a noteworthy figure because we know from the Victory Point message that he travelled inland, setting up message cairns, received a field promotion from Lieutenant, and died before the message cairn was reopened. We know all this because he thought it was important enough to mention in the terrible edition scrawled on the margins. There's a bit of grim weirdness about the Victory Point message that I didn't touch on before, that Fitzjames gets the year wrong. 
more than once. It's been suggested that this is evidence of lead poisoning. We know that at some point the ships moved after they were abandoned. Where they were found is very far from where they were left. It's possible that they moved with the ice, but more likely some or all the living men returned and tried to sail them out when the ice weakened. They were then separated and Erebus was crushed while Terra was abandoned again and eventually sank. I'm going to give you some more details on the black men story from the last video because I feel it's the single saddest part of this horribly sad story. In short, an Inuit finds one of the ships and goes on board, only to be surrounded by a group of men with black faces who are shouting at him, until an officer arrives and makes him release him. What really gets to me is that shouts might have been cheers and the men might have thought they were being rescued. And from the point of view of the poor Inuit, it must have been a horror story come to life. Now, about the black faces, in the last video I mentioned the probably unlikely blackface explanation, but I also mentioned that it's possible the faces were scurvy. I chose my words poorly there. I meant it's thought that the poor man who was accosted might have seen the dark gums connected to scurvy and his terrified mind might have thought it was the whole face. But it's also possibly coal dust from trying to work the steam engine, which also controlled the central heating. Or it could have been severe frostbite or even a primitive balaclava made from fabrics they had lying around. And the possibility that there were actually black crewmen aboard isn't crazy to say the least. And where does the they thought the ring rescued idea come from? Well, Charles Hall's translator is one who suggested that the three great shouts the black men gave the Inuit were likely hip hip hoorays. I think that's just about enough. I have even more if you'd like to hear more about the Franklin expedition and how the whole thing gets worse the more you know about it. But also the silver lining is the Franklin expedition in some ways marked a thawing in the relationship between the UK and the USA. Let me know if you want more in the comments.